Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween in Middle School for Life. Wow, it is uh, 23 hours and 8 minutes into the uh, uh, 21st day of October 2021, and we are sort of moving along with the observation vlogs. Hmm. Well, Lionel hasn't totally uh, left uh, YouTube. He's giving enough sort of of his uh, his <clears throat> his version of events uh, along the lines of Alex uh, Alex uh, Jones, um, what's his name, Glenn Beck, and the like. A large chunk of these uh, pundits are now moving behind these called the paywall uh, of subscription. And uh, if you don't have the money to pay for it, then well, then you're you know, he says he's the only one who's talking about the stuff. Well, not 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 necessarily true. You can come here. You can sort of hear what uh, he's talking about to a certain degree. But we go into a little bit more depth than he does. Uh, he does the deep dive on his channel, but you have to pay for it. Here it's free. But uh, I only spend about a half hour. And the reason why I spend a half hour because I've done the hour before. I've done the sort of the, the length of time. And uh, it doesn't work out because most people will not sit through the entire hour. The most you'll get is maybe a half hour. So right now, his uh, last uh, thing was about 22 minutes in length. That's about the time, in terms of my analytics, what I'm seeing is that uh, that's the uh, sort of average amount of time that people will spend uh, watching a particular video. That And that's the level of depth of study that they do. This is it. This is This is the information. And he says, you know, you can't, you can't do history, you can't do this, you can't do that on YouTube. But the thing is, uh, you, you can actually do this. It really depends on uh, on your perspective and the uh, sort of the views that you bring forward. You have to be careful with what you say. But this is true in any case because you can't, you don't, you can no longer be provocative in, if you're on the, uh, not on the so-called the leftist side of things. You have to be more reasonable. And of course, this may be lost on some people because, once again, there are schools of history called reason and uh, the schools of reason. And they were parts of the school who, who were realists. There is a school of realists and realism. And these are all these are all different academic branches, if you will, uh, that came out of humanism. So, of course, so you have the realists and you have the surrealists. But if you go back to everything and just look at see who is going to see the Pope begin to realize that this whole sphere of where we sit, as we sit within the Roman Catholic sphere, that the, gov the shadow government, which can be defined, as I said, it just makes it takes a bit of time to understand how you're going to define it, uh, and, and again, in, in these negative terms, by looking at the surrounding environment. And in this case here, we're looking at, we're looking at uh, the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire. This is where we see the emergence of the papacy as a particular uh, political force, Matter of fact, it was a fighting military force. They, this is where you had the Knights Teutonic. We got our train. I'm waiting for more horns. Moving on, it's around in the corner. The short blast means there are other trains in the area. That long horn was crossing the road. There's a railway crossing there. So that's the, the long horn is crossing the road. And it came out of the right wa wave guide. And because it was so close that we know that the, the train is now moving eastbound. It's an eastbound train. So this, this is part of observation. You, you can get these uh, sort of 
idea of what's going on, even though you're not visibly present, so you can't see what's going on, but you can hear what's going on. You can use audio signals to determine direction and other things. But this is all part of observation. This is how observation works. And it takes a long time to really go back to the physics and sort of get an understanding. Let me adjust this a little bit more. Okay, better. I think I was a little too high. I wasn't getting the top of my head, so the camera's a little close. I should have put it further back. Uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, anyways, you can go into history by not looking at necessarily the official documentation, the, the, what you find in your textbook, but there's often, because, particularly because history is rather murky, at the cloudy bit. You are never, never trained in history. They always say, oh, I'm trained in history. Well, yay for you, because you're now a barking seal and you've accepted what was what, what was told to you. You haven't gone out and questioned uh, that you're backing. You didn't question, how do you know what was told to you, what was taught to you was true? And this is where a large chunk of the problem, and this is sort of what Tolstoy was leading up to, is that, that uh, we are given a perception of history in our classes, in our academia. And the academia, is, if you look, do the observation of academia, the academia for a long time has had a sense of, a sense of self where it creates its own reality. It doesn't necessarily follow, uh, uh, well, what's called reality. And this is where we have to deal with the difference between rhetoric ideo or, or, or ideology and reality, because more often the rhetoric and the ideology, which is academic in its origins, uh, are typically uh, nowhere near what reality is. They have their own senses to this. And because we have never really left the Catholic sphere, we're still under the papacy. This is why everyone goes to see the Pope, including the Dalai Lama. Uh, the Pope is the central figure. He is the he is the, that is is where the shadow government is, and everybody within that sphere, including the Jews, are simply apparati within the uh, shadow government. So you have one person at the head, and you have uh, as your new world order, if you will. But you have other what's called pretenders to the throne. Uh, if you look into the history of something known as vassal kings, and vassal princes, vassal royalty, you'll understand that the, that the way the royalty works is that royalty is appointed, ordained by God. And of course, in this case, God is is the Pope, and that's what he is. He's Pope on earth. He's God on earth. This is his official title, the Vicar of Christ, which in Greek is Antichrist. <laughs> ironically enough. If you want to view it as a form of irony, uh, and you can take that as far as you want to take it, but they're the ones who set up the Teutonic Knights. The Teutonic Knights are the ones who became the Knights Hospitaller and Hospitaller Hospitallers. Uh, they became the Hospitallers became the Rosicrucians. The uh, Knights Templar uh, became your Masons. Uh, this is who they were before then, and so. You have a large chunk of your what we call Gnostic history coming out of the Roman Catholic Church. So, if you're going to be studying Gnosticism, you're going to need to study the, the the Roman Catholic Church to a significant degree to understand where a large chunk of the magic came from. Uh, and a large chunk of these these these, these so-called the aristocracy of Europe, they're still there. They're still functioning. They're still the King of Sweden. They're still the King the royalty of Denmark. They're simply what, what they've said stepped aside to allow the people to decide their own fate. It doesn't mean that these states aren't, in, uh, aren't taking over all commerce. This was pointed out in uh, uh, the 1980s comedy, uh, Yes Minister, Yes Prime Minister, where they basically nationalized everything and everything was run by, you know, you wanted to be a uh, uh, the head of industry, you want to be head of the steel mill, right? They have, want to be the steel magnet. Well, that was uh, that was not available by to anyone except through peerage. Peerage is is that you give political appointees, and, and this captive and industry was a political appointee because the government fundamentally owned it, owned the uh, the industry. <laughs> and this is the same thing with universal music. Universal music is a peerage. Uh, it, it, it is given to people from France, uh, the, the head points, who uh, have done an excellent job in the eyes of the prime minister or president. In other words. 
it is a political appointee, uh, appointee uh, uh, political appointment, I should say, uh, where enough brownie points have been have been have been scored with either the prime minister or president that they are that you are now recommended to hold this particular position. So if you're aware that your your position is running on one political party or another, you tend to tend to support one or another, but you do it in such a manner that you leave yourself on out so that as the government changes, you can then switch your position and be favorable to the new person coming in. Uh, I think that this is the whole sense of bureaucracy, bureaucracy as well. You can see this in, uh, the, again, the BBC show, uh, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister. Uh, and this is something that that uh, Lionel doesn't do. He doesn't give you references to go see more, to see more and get a better sense of these things. But if you don't do this, you don't go and find these shows because they are hard to find. They're, they're, they're hidden for a particular reason. Uh, the same thing with G's and Worcester. Uh, this is why I think, you know, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was not created to protect artists. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act was designed to eliminate problematic problematic uh, references in history. They, they, if you're going to re re rewrite history, then you need to get rid of anything that comes up and contradicts this. This is why the papacy has spent so long trying to destroy the Eastern Christian Church. Well, but why? Because the Eastern Christian Church contradicts the papacy. There is no papal primacy with the Eastern Christian Church. So how do you deal with it? You get rid of it. Same thing works on the, with Islam. Why is Sunni Islam the way Sunni, has, Sunni Islam is? Again, centered on Saudi Arabia. Because Muhammad, you know, the prophet Muhammad, was he went down the Shia track. So you want to get rid of Muhammad? You want to get rid, rid of the original uh, Muslim church or the, the original Islam, that which is, which is Shia? Then you get rid of the Shia. And this is what the Sunnis are doing. The Sunnis go in and attack. Uh, this is what you're seeing now in Afghanistan. This is the Sunnis are going crazy, attacking all the Shia. They just had another suicide bombing. Uh, killing I don't know how many people uh, at a Shia at a Shia mosque. The Shia understand that the Shia understand that the Sunnis at some point in time when they're given the opportunity will turn around and start killing the Shia. It's not just simply about Christians and this and that. It's 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 an all out bloodbath. This is what they talk about sectarian violence. And you could you have different agencies in there, the, the intel agencies, all in there working just the way you see saw them in uh, in the American politics uh, involved in. Uh, Shifting political direction from one point to another because they're embedded in these groups like BLM, Antifa, Proud Boys. Uh, there's a lot of federal agents around in this particular point. And I have people in my family uh, who uh, came up through uh, the American uh, RO, called ROTC program, an ROTC, uh, Reserve Officer in Training Corps. Uh, they were at university, they didn't want to get sent to Vietnam, so. Uh, and they needed a way to pay for university, so the, R the ROTC was a way to do that. And uh, my uncles, uh, who were more, were Greek, but they were, became more Americanized uh, as they grew up in the Greek in, in the American culture. They be, became, you know, fundamentally American. This was the so-called uh, uh, what you call the uh, melting pot. And they gave, they they for the for the prizes they got for the positions they got, uh, it was a good deal for them. They got they went very far, and unfortunately, they kind of lost uh, their sense in terms of who they were initially, and gained a new identity that was kind of well, but it's basically false. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, they would always be as as reserve as these officers. A lot of them were assigned to intelligence positions. And they were agents, and they were sent out to all these parties and this and that. And they were always present. And when they would show, they'd show up, they would see other people they knew who were in other other branches of intelligence. And they say half the party were uh, intelligence officers. So, uh, you know, th th this is not something new. This is something that's old. This was back in the 1960s, the 1950s. Uh, so it's not something new. It's something old. Uh, that's been going on for a long time. It's just what happens is there, there are different variations of it now. And as Lionel was saying today, is that there, there's now a growing battle between different two, two different poles. Uh, you know, the Europeans, the 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 the, 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 um, 
The Catholics have one vision of a new world order, but they've tried several times. It's not just one new world order. Uh, they tried with uh, they tried uh, with the Russians. The Soviet Union was an attempt at a new world order. That failed. Um, the Nazis were a second attempt, and now we're in the midst of a third attempt. <laughs> Uh, that's not going too well. Because the fly in the ointment, as uh, Lionel said, are are basically the BRICS company, uh, country, countries. And that's basically, Brazil, well, not so much Brazil, but really it's it's, uh, it's Russia and China. Uh, India's been kind of knocked out, I think, because they've got enough of a, a liberal Congress that the liberals have sort of knocked India out of, of the sort of the, the BRICS to a certain degree. And they aren't the economic force they used to be. But China still is. They haven't been able to knock out China. And they simply don't, un and the problem, the problem is they simply don't understand China. They don't understand what China is. And I'm not going to reveal that because I get a lot of my stuff from China and I enjoy uh, being on the Chinese side of things, on, on the Asian side of things. Uh, the dire warnings that are coming from uh, of the newspapers, the mainstream media, and even Lionel, Lionel himself. Uh, this has to do more with uh, propaganda than anything else, because a large chunk of it is coming out of the CIA and, uh, well, basically the shadow government. And I think the Mossad is part of this shadow government, because, as I said before, the Jews were always the middlemen, and in many cases the banker for the Vatican. So you have the Vatican as the head, they're the royalty. The bankers were the Jews. That was the that's the those are the Rothschilds. This is where the why the Rothschild banking system is so powerful is because uh, uh, because they were the bankers to the Vatican, and you did not mess with the Vatican because the Vatican was God on her. He still is God on her. That's his official title, and everyone flocks to him for you know politically and even religiously. This is why the Dalai Lama went, went, went out while well, how excuse me. This is how the Dalai Lama ended up in, in, in uh, going to Rome to meet the Pope. <laughs> uh, they did the same thing to the, the Greek patriarch, or the, the patriarchate of, of Constantinople, the noble Constantinople. Uh, well, has the, uh, Constant, uh, the Church of Constantinople uh, uh, collapsed and fallen at the feet of the papacy? Well, no, the, the patriarch has, but the church itself hasn't. Uh, Although a lot of people have followed them. They don't understand that, that, that now the patriarchate, the patriarch and the patriarchy, because don't forget, once you have the patriarch, you have the apparatus, you have the, the, the bureaucrats. This is why I mentioned or I recommend seeing, uh, looking at yes minister and yes prime minister. You understand, you'll get the best understanding of what the bureaucracy is and how it functions through these two, partic two particular programs. They're comedies, but the writing is superb, the acting is superb, so that you get a sense for what was going on at that particular time. And remember, this is the 1980s. A large chunk of the issues that we're talking about today was mentioned back then, and this was this was uh, uh, basically a production of BBC. So uh, uh, you can see that the, how BBC is, is how BBC was back then, and how it is now. And there's been a fundamental shift to really skew a large chunk of the programs back into government control. In other words, it's all about government control. And this is the part of the problem. The people who are leftists, and call themselves leftists here, remember we have to go back and define them. Are they modernist leftists or are they postmodernist leftists? Two fundamentally different things. The postmodernist has no loyalty to anything. They can be, it could be whatever you want it to be. But the thing is, the thing is, is that a person who is a leftist, or even let's say a rightist, you know, person on the right, if a person believes what they're doing, and this is the best way of of, of turning, a, 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 we call a blind agent. The best agents are the blind agents. Why are they blind? Because they believe in what they're doing. They believe in what they've been told. And so now they're working not from a position of of just general ideology. They're now working from a position of, I believe this. This is their belief. This is, they've, they've, come, become, they've come to identify with the ideology to a point where they cannot separate themselves from the ideology. And so you cannot argue with this person against, you know, leftists or 
or, or, or communists or Marx or whatever they're calling themselves. Of course, we, if you stand back enough, you've been red, red pilled enough, and there's a talk about the succession of red pills. If you've done this enough, then you're outside the matrix and you can see that this is a work. You can see that these things are false. But the problem is the person inside the matrix doesn't see this. So how do you get the information that's from the outside on the inside? Because you can't. You have to take the person that's on the inside of the matrix and slowly but surely, you know, <coughs> the wind is blowing. It's fairly windy. So it's also raining up. So here's the thing. Here's your here's your planet. The person, and this is basically where the matrix is. The person who is uh, within the matrix is either on the surface in the matrix that can't see outside. So you have to get them to the surface. You have to get them to the surface. And once they're at the, sur at the surface, like that, they're on the out somewhat on the outside. They're still orbiting. They'll still be going around and attached to that planet. That's called the matrix. You have to separate that person at the point of being outside where they're called a valence electron. This is where you can now start pulling them away. But it's the process to get them to this particular point that is the issue because, again, this is not a short process, but a long process. And this is why QLAR uh, takes as long as it does. There, there are people leaving work. Uh, it takes, the reason why it takes, QLAR takes as long as it does because it takes about a month or two to really get information from one point to the next to really have it disseminate uh, down to a more of what I call an individual or a personal level. And remember, people do not think logically. This is what Lionel's missing. There is no logic in most people's in most people's functions or actions. Most people think and react emotionally. This is what this is what political political campaigns are all about. Why are they bringing in? Into, in fear. Why aren't they talking about the issue? Because you look at every television show, particularly kid shows, when they're running for class president, who wins? The person who puts on the best show. It's never about the issues. The issues that are talked about in the news, and it's, this is the stage. This is the political, the, the news becomes the world stage of politics. It's a work. It's a fiction. It is what Edward Bernays always called it and always understood it to be. It is not reality. It is a show. And, and Edward Bernays was back in 1950. He was Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson. And the thing is, he, he, he would talk, talk about blackface was because one of his clients that he was working with, with Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson, was, uh, I can't remember when it was, uh, Al Jolson. Al Jolson was the originator of blackface. His whole routine, his vaudeville routine, centered around blackface. There's a history to it. But most people will never understand this. You want to understand history? Let's say you're reading, you're a comic book reader. You want to understand the history of what's going on now with, uh, with the vaccines? Go read X-Men. Go to Spider-Man. Now, go back into the history of these comic books. See where they came from. And you'll understand, you'll see, because you'll bump into uh, 1930s. Spider-Man was still around at that time. You still have these comics around at this particular point of time. And they're talking about eugenics. Eugenics is your genetics. Eugenics is your vaccines. They are, that's what they are. And so it's not, again, not something new. It's something old. It's something that's been there for a long time. And it's just a matter of bringing the person from one point to the next point. And it's a slow process. So, you know, in the meantime, sit back, relax, and try to figure out uh, the best way to uh, live and, in some ways enjoy your life. Uh, anyways, uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, we've got a bit of a storm that I'm watching. Uh, i got about another hour or so left, and uh, I'll see you uh, probably tomorrow night, hopefully, if I'm feeling well enough. All right. See you then. We are Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Tween in Middle School for Life.